For those of us committed to social justice, sustainability is never singular. It's always plural and it is always intertwined with working with others. The sustainabilities that are in play amongst us are not the idea of living within limits that define contemporary notions of sustainability. The idea of sustainabilities is first and foremost a desire to challenge the limits of what is considered possible. This is the central provocation that motivates this conference. It's a provocation that I want to pose in the form of three questions. One, what are the resources we need to create and sustain social justice movements and critique? Two, how can we extend our capacities and push the limits of what is possible? And three, how can we enliven and invigorate our movements, institutions, and analysis in ways that break down existing limitations while sustaining our efforts, ourselves, and our communities? These are difficult questions to answer clearly, and it takes vision, drive, commitment, and imagination to answer them. And there is no other person that I can think of with more vision, drive, commitment, or imagination than the person we are privileged to have as our keynote speaker, Raina Gossett. I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. <laughs> I didn't introduce her, I just said her name and that's what happens. <laughs> Say her name. Um, three years ago, at Scholar and Feminist 38, Utopia, we asked participants to imagine the impossible. Raina Gossett led a workshop on prison abolition and presented a vision of activism that centered the most marginalized and imagined a world in which no one is disposable. Later, as a BCRW activist fellow, Raina expanded this vision in conversations with Dean Spade and Cece McDonald in what have become some of BCRW's most widely watched and shared podcasts by daring us to practice everyday acts of abolition. We at the BCRW have been incredibly fortunate to work with Raina as an activist fellow over the past two years. Raina is truly a visionary whose artistic and activist practice has challenged us to rethink and re-examine our approach to every issue. Her activism includes her work as the membership director of the Silvia Rivera Law Project from 2010 to 2014, where she worked on behalf of trans and gender nonconforming people and took part in the successful campaign to end healthcare discrimination to low-income trans and gender nonconforming New Yorkers. It extends as well to her work, early work, earlier work for Queers for Economic Justice and Critical Resistance, where she organized low-income LGBT, G, and C New Yorkers in a campaign that stopped New York City's Department of Corrections from building a $375 million new jail in the Bronx. Most recently, Raina has collaborated with Sasha Wurzel on writing and directing the upcoming short film, Happy Birthday, Marsha. The film imagines the lives of activists Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera in the events leading up to the Stonewall Riots. It is a creative intervention um, into what Raina has called the violence of historical erasure and demonstrates Raina's commitment to lifting up and celebrating the history of trans women of color's activism, creativity, and resilience. Connecting the history of liberal pol liberation politics with the insistence that we prefigure the world we want to live in, Raina offers a compelling vision of the resources we need most to sustain social justice feminism and activism in ways that allow us to nurture and respect one another and to create the world we want to live in. We are thrilled to welcome her as our keynote for this year's Scholar and Feminist Conference. Join me in welcoming Raina Gossett. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Um, thank you so much for having me here. This is such a pleasure to be speaking with everyone early on. This room's packed on a Saturday morning. Um, and I think that speaks to really clearly the work that um, BCRW does, right, um, in providing space for those of us who are activists, who are academics, those of us who are artists, those of us who 
as my friend Tina would say, double dutch between all of those categories and work together to try to figure out the world together um, to make meaning of our conditions, um, to offer up visions um, and ways out of what we're having to deal with. And so it's really beautiful to be able to do that work with everyone here this morning today. I'm gonna do something that I don't usually do, which is do uh, kind of a little bit of reading and speaking. So I'm gonna double dutch between reading and speaking. And first, I'm gonna introduce myself again. Um, that was just such an amazing, I was like, who is that person Tina is talking about? Um, that was a really wonderful introduction. Um, but I just wanted to say, so I'm Raina Gossett. Um, I'm an activist, writer, and artist. And my background is in uh, movement building, right? And doing uh, social movement building work that centers the people who are most affected by multiple forms of oppression because we know that we're powerful and capable of transforming the world, right? It's that principle of self-determination, right? The people most affected by an issue um, are powerful and capable of strategizing around it and ultimately transforming their relationship around it. And right now, I'm doing it primarily through art and aesthetics, right? I'm looking at the feels and sounds of liberation, um, the moving images of gender self-determination. Um, and I'm really excited to share that with everyone this morning. But I, before I want to say, just like, it is so important to be in this room, in a room that understands that feminist movements um, must always and are inextricably linked to movements for trans liberation, um, inextricably linked to movements for disability justice, inextricably linked to movements to end settler colonialism and the prison industrial complex and the underlying carceral logics um, that support it, right? And when I say carceral logics, I mean, as Tina would say, define our terms, just really simply the notions that punishment um, make people safer, right? That punishment and exile um, are real solutions to actual problems. And we who are prison abolitionists would say, no, actually punishment um, and exile aren't solutions to the real harm that happens in our community. So I think it's really important to just say, like, thank you for this space. Thank you for co-creating a feminist space that really puts at the forefront prison abolition, that puts at the forefront trans liberation and for inviting so many of us into, um, into that work, into BCRW to do it. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna read a little bit. I have um, about like, some audio that I'm gonna share, some moving images, and we're gonna do some q and I just wanna do, like, um, this is what's gonna happen. And before I do that, I wanna name um, that this beautiful image right here is made by um, Michael Bazant, and it's gonna stay up here while I talk, and it's an image of the 1969 Stonewall Riots, um, which is really at the heart of a lot of my work. How many people are familiar with the Stonewall Riots? Great. Yes, this is the room to be in on a Saturday morning. Um, these folks are not. Yes. Or you are, okay. Maybe some people were here, some people were at the Stonewall Riots that are in this room, that's probably possible. Right? Um, so this image is made by Michael Bazant, who is an artist and activist, and who um, contributes a lot to social movements through Micah's um, artistic work. That's better. Thank you. This audience is so affirming. Um, <laughs> and so Micah made this illustration of the 1969 Stonewall Riots and really put at the forefront uh, members of our community who are so often erased from that moment, right? So um, in particular, street queens, um, butch folks, um, people who were doing sex work, uh, and including Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, and Miss Major, all of whom I'm gonna talk about in a little while. So um, to start, last night someone on Twitter said, I am so proud of us for making it through this week. Do something nice for yourself tonight. You fucking deserve it. This sentiment feels so right to me. It's so spot on. After a week of many of us navigating state and interpersonal violence, including learning of the deaths of so many trans and gender nonconforming people of color, and the rise of legislation in South Dakota and throughout the US targeting trans and gender nonconforming people using things like bathrooms. Um, going into public space. 
overall, this week felt like it held a lot for us and that we do need to do something to celebrate ourselves for moving through it. Two days ago, as I made my way through LaGuardia Airport, traveling to take part in a conversation about black women fighting criminalization, I set off an alarm in the body scanner at the airport. As a TSA, uh, just, um, just to pause, so um, there's a lot of conversation about like content warnings, when to offer them, what a safe space. I do want to offer a content warning for, for my reading that I'm going to be talking about issues of structural oppression and violence, issues of sexual violence, of transphobia, um, and I think it's really important to just name that. That's something that we're going to be having to grapple with and listen to. Um, so, two days ago as I made my way through LaGuardia Airport, traveling to take part in a conversation about black women fighting criminalization, I set off an alarm in the body scanner at the airport. As the TSA agent went about touching the most intimate parts of my body, they told me that they just couldn't understand how someone who looks so good has an anatomy like mine. Trans and gender nonconforming people have kind of consistently had a hard time in the airport. It's actually something that's receiving a bit of press and is um, kind of finally widely acknowledged. Uh, these experiences have been even hashtagged on Twitter um, with the hashtag flying while trans. In part because trans and gender nonconforming people with a wide degree of power and privilege have to access uh, airports and navigate the TSA. Um, so while I wasn't surprised that this interaction was happening, what struck me more was how routine these kinds of violence happen in our lives, right? How mundane, how quotidian, how everyday. What did strike me was that even as a long-term organizer and activist, I felt isolated by this interaction. I actually felt ashamed, like I did something wrong. As Angela Davis, who was a comrade, oh, hi, hi, welcome, um, a comrade, and critical resistance uh, wrote in Abolition Democracy, if we take the TSA and their uniforms were swapped for civilian clothes, we might understand this action as it is. Unwanted touching of an intimate part of our bodies, provisionally okayed out of fear that if we were to say stop, it might escalate the situation. That's just another way of saying sexual violence, right? A pervasive and sweeping violence that trans and gender nonconforming people are having to navigate right now, so many of us. The kind of violence that has never not been a part of interacting with state agencies, for those of us who do, um, in institutions like prisons, police precincts, and immigration detention centers. And I offer that up because there's a lot of conversation about bathrooms, right, and bathroom access, and that's really important. There's been a lot of conversation about access to colleges like Barnard for trans and gender nonconforming people. But I offer up the, the specific institutions of immigration detention centers, police precincts, and prisons, because those are places where many of us who are people of color, who are disabled, who are low income, have to frequently navigate, and we're often told, like, if you're having a hard time, if you're in one of those institutions, it's your own fault, and you don't deserve a level of safety, right? You don't deserve uh, freedom from those forms of violence. So for me, I think it's really important to talk about um, what are the institutions that those of us who are most vulnerable have to go through and start there, um, as opposed to starting at places like bathrooms and airports. So that's why I'm offering that up. Um, a framework that has been useful for me to understand this kind of miasmic violence shaping the world around me is called the five eyes of oppression, right? So those of us who have been doing movement work um, often talk about the five eyes of oppression. Are people familiar with that? Yes, okay, some, some not, love it. The five eyes of oppression, for many of us, we identify them as ideological, institutional, interpersonal, internalized, and isolation, right? So, for example, ideologies like the gender binary and anti-black racism and ableism underpin institutions that produce the kinds of brutal conditions and interpersonal interactions that so many of us have to navigate daily and that are always too much. And for those of us navigating oppression on multiple levels, we've come to realize that oppression doesn't just affect our material condition, right? It doesn't just affect like how much money we um, can access, uh, what kind of jobs we can get, whether or not we can have a college degree. 
it also affects how we feel about ourselves, right? It gets in us, it moves through us. Um, some people call this internalized. Um, I like to say, like, oppression moves through me. Um, and it often causes me to, like, feel bad about myself. Um, so that's just another way of saying, like, so many of us are really exhausted by this moment of heightened violence, right? Oppression has really changed the way that we've been feeling about ourselves. Um, even more unsettling, though, is that this violence that we're talking about, so for those of us who don't know, this past year, 2015, was um, widely reported as having the highest rates of um, violence against trans and gender non-conforming people, the highest rate of murder against trans women of color and trans and gender non-conforming people of color. And that was happening at the same time as we were seeing a new level and a new wave of trans visibility in pop culture, right? Um, so films like The Danish Girl, or Caitlyn Jenner on the cover of Vanity Fair, or um, TV shows like Transparent were all happening in this moment. And my friend and theorist Eric Stanley offered a quote, which, is, um, which I'm gonna read, and Eric says, The same systems that nominate the Danish girl film for an Academy Award, uh, Academy Award also lock Chelsea Manning in solitary confinement. This is modernity, not its antagonism, right? So I think for those of us who are in social movements, it's really important for us to think about how visibility for trans and gender nonconforming people often accompanies the heightened forms of violence that we have to navigate. So given how pressing this violence is, how little is offered in terms of how we're able to assimilate in order to escape it. it I think it's really important for me in this moment to think about um, how do we sustain ourselves, right? In a moment of heightened violence and increased visibility, which could also be called increased surveillance of our communities, how do we sustain ourselves? And in fact, how do we make a way out of no way, right? Um, making a way out of no way is a term that was frequently used throughout the black freedom movement um, and continues, I think, to be, move, uh, to be useful for us to think about these conditions that we have to survive and the ways that we survive them. So that was the introduction to making a way out of no way, right? Um, so more and more, I have come to understand the importance of coming together um, and breaking isolation as a way of making a way out of no way, right? So isolation is so important, I've come to understand, to maintaining oppression that it's really powerful when we come together like when we did this morning and try to make sense of the world together. Um, last March, I went to Chicago for the Women of Color um, Against Violence Conference, um, as well as the Transgender Law Center National Convening of Trans and Gender Conforming People. And we were there to talk about anti-violence strategies. How many people in the room were there? Yes, hello. Um, it was powerful, right? Um, we were there to really think with each other and through our experiences about how we can make a way out of no way, how we can sustain ourselves in this moment. Um, and ultimately what I found is we're doing it beautifully already, right? We're doing it through the ways that we relate to each other, make meaning of our history and the issues we're navigating together. Our sociability, right? As Fred Moten um, you know, was talking to me, um, Fred was like, this is what we're defending, right? We're defending these really beautiful ways of coming together. So one of, as someone who is, you know, really in love with trans history, one of the moments that feels so compelling to me is this moment in New York City in pre-Stonewall when street queens and trans women like Michael Bazant illustrated so beautifully were hanging out and trying to do that work of making meaning together. Um, and I'm going to ask Hope to share the first clip of Sylvia Rivera talking about that. You sit around just try to figure out when it, when this harassment would come to an end. And we, we would always dream that one day it would come to an end. And we prayed and we looked for it. We wanted to be human beings. So to me, I think that, right, so Sylvia Rivera, 
a legendary, iconic trans woman um, activist who was born in the Bronx in 1950, was among uh, the first people to fight back in 1969 at the Stonewall riots. To me, she's talking about speculation, right? This, this idea that you keep asking the same question over and over and over again to get deeper, right? That's what we're doing today. We're asking questions over and over again in the hopes of having a deeper understanding of how do we make a way out of oppression? Um, and so I think that's a lot of what we did in Chicago, right? We came together because we found the importance of coming together and speculating. Um, so I'm going to ask Hope to play GFOS's first and second clip. And then I'm going to introduce who GFOS is. I don't know. Last year we funded 68 groups and organizations from around the country. And if you looked at the report, the 2014 report, you would see that one of the running themes throughout is that people are just trying to connect with each other, um, knowing that we can't do this work or survive on our own. Um, I think the best part was to be in a room filled with uh, about 100 people from 22 states, um, trans and gender nonconforming people who are talking about how they're dealing or surviving or um, their loss around community and violence, anti-violence. Um, I think it was amazing to hear from just different strategies and different hopes and dreams and also just to be sharing space as trans people. We don't always get to share space with each other. Gabriel Foster is uh, the director of the Trans Justice Funding Project and was one of the people who helped convene us all together in Chicago. And to me, and is a former coworker of mine at the Sylvia Vera Law Project. To me, I think that clip of Gabriel talking about why it's important to be together really illustrates conditions, right? The conditions of isolation. So much of oppression is maintained by having um, real isolation from each other, whether it's through um, ICE detention centers, whether it's through um, the fact that we're surveyed, whether it's through the prison industrial complex, people being in prison. Isolation is a real form of violence that trans and gender nonconforming people of color have to navigate every day. So when we're together, it really illustrates how we can dream together, how we can create new ways of relating to each other, and we can get deeper and try to understand the conditions that we're having to deal with, and then develop strategies to fight back. So I'm going to also ask Hope to play Brooke Serta's clip. So if you want healing, you know, it's violence if you don't. If you don't we cannot be together. We need uh, our mirrors, we need our stories, we need, we need like, you know, I mean, we grew up, you know, alone with no one, you know, the, you know, to me, it's like, I can cook, I can do nothing because they like, they pushed me away from that because they, they knew that's, you know, that, you know, they wanted to kill the woman. So that's, you know, you don't want to be a cook or any like seamstress, nothing feminine. So now I'm like, Ugh. So yeah, it is, it is very, very healing. We need to be together. I like, this is, this is just like the best thing for me. I go to the groups because of that, you know. So Brooke Serta is a Latina trans woman activist here in New York City. And you know, she was naming the kind of personal effects of being together, which I really resonated with. Um, in terms of like seeing ourselves in each other, right? We need to be each other's mirror. And I think one of the really challenging things of heightened visibility is that a lot of times that desire for needing ourselves to be mirrored, right? The fact that we exist, get absorbed in institutions that aren't really designed for us, right? So whether like keep going back to the Danish girl or Hollywood right now, selling back our desire in these kind of really contradictory ways, these really compromised ways of needing to see ourselves, needing to reflect our truths to each other. Um, so, and I think really that's one of the other things that we're defending in this moment, our ability to come together, to reflect back our lives and our loves together without replicating the logics of the state. I think that's one of the reasons the state is so terrified of us coming together in public, right? At the time of the Stonewall riots in 1969, 
New York City had anti-cross-dressing laws, which are still actually alive in many prisons and institutions today, which meant at the time in New York City that if you were assigned male at birth, right, so if you were born in the hospital and the doctor looked at your genitals and said, oh, you're a boy, and you weren't wearing three articles of clothing that were associated with being a, a boy or being a man, you could be criminalized, right? You could be arrested, especially if you were in public, especially if you were disabled, especially if you're a person of color, especially if you're doing sex work. And so I think that's really one of the most powerful things that we're saying is being together, being expressing who we are, and being public about it is a really terrifying thing for the state because it builds power between us. Um, I'm now gonna ask Hope to play a clip of Miss Major. Now, one of the most exciting things to me is watching a girl go catch the bus in the middle of the day in her shit, you know, like, yes! Because when I was growing up, you know, you better you don't even look at your front door and the sun's out. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, ooh, I'm in my stuff, let me run in the backyard <laughs> and run back in the house. <laughs> if you were out and you were in your stuff, uh, you could get arrested. You know, they came up with laws like you had to wear three articles of men's clothing if you were a transgender uh, woman uh, to arrest us and put us in jail. You were criminalized for just breathing, you know. What's wound up happening is it's gotten better, but it's not where it should be, you know. We don't get the respect that we deserve for the decisions and stuff that we've made. We are in this every day. Now, whether we display it outside ourselves or not, that doesn't change how you think or feel about yourself, you know, and we need to be given the respect and understanding to, un to acknowledge that you don't have to belong to an agency and you don't have to feel that, you know, that you're a part of this and you're in this group. You can be an individual person and do the things that you feel you can do to challenge the status quo, period, you know. Uh, for me, not just all the stuff that I do politically, but on a personal level, what I did was change all of my identification back to male because it dawned on me, wait a minute, I did this because I didn't want pressure from people. I didn't want to be in the bathroom and they go, we're showing your ID and it says male on it. So I, I did like everybody else did, I had female on everything. And then it dawned on me, wait a minute, I don't even, I don't feel female. I want people to know I'm a transgender person and love me for that. Fuck this other stuff. So I changed everything back to male. So that was my way to strike back. And you have to find your way to strike back. And it's a personal thing. You know, this group stuff is nice, and yeah, we have to get together and work on abolishing what's going on. But the personal stuff is what gives you the strength to go forward. So I, I was having this conversation with Miss Major while I was at Insight, and that part of the conversation really struck me, right? In this moment when so many of us are being mobilized around um, being able to access ID and change our genders on ID, Miss Major was throwing a wrench in that system, saying, whoa, 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 this actually doesn't work for all of us, and was really illuminating the trap of the gender binary, right? Um, and Ms. Major is someone who has worked within formal organizations, so she was the executive director of the Transgender Gender Variant Intersex Justice Project, and, which is like, what a name, that's amazing, right? Um, and outside of formal organizations. But as she said, we don't have to be in formal organizations to do the profound work of never being what the state or the mainstream white gay rights movement see as normal. Ms. Major emphasizes the historical importance of small individual acts of liberation that refuse and seek to undermine the gender binary and assimilation, right? So these small personal acts of resistance and refusal have created space for so many of us to come together and to support one another. As Ms. Major was saying, at a time of heightened violence, just by hanging out with each other, by taking care of each other, we are doing revolutionary work. And for me, I really, it gave me great pause because I had to ask myself, well, what's my way of striking back, right? I'm deeply embedded in social movements. I'm an art of it, artist and activist, artivist, which is like, I just made that up. Thank you, VCRW. Um, and what's my personal way of striking back? And I think, personally, it takes a lot of courage, right? To be vulnerable and to understand that um, you have something on the line and you wanna share that with the world. And for me right now, it's my film, Happy Birthday, Marsha. 
which I um, co-directed and um, produced with Sasha Wurzel. And it is, how many people are familiar with the film? Cool, okay, great, thank you. Um, so it's a short film that traces uh, Miss Major's contemporary, Marsha P. Johnson, who was a black trans woman who was one of the first to physically resist at Stonewall. Um, it traces her life in the hours leading up to the Stonewall riots. Um, and I'm gonna ask Hope to play the trailer and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. So I think I just wanna, um, cause I'm, now I'm like, am I really off track? Are people not understanding the connection between sustainable? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, thank you. I think just to make it really clear, right? We're in a moment of brutal conditions, right? Some of the highest forms of violence that we've ever seen for trans and gender non-conforming people. We need an abundance of strategies to navigate and to sustain us. Some of those are looking at the structures and systems that are designed to control and kill us and dismantling them. Some of those are about changing policies to make things a little bit better, right? So changing your ID, um, being able to access ID. And then other of those, right? So this is change, dismantle, grow. Other of those are about building and dreaming beyond the current ideologies and institutions that we have to navigate in order to create new ways of relating to each other that sustain us, right? That help us through these moments of immense amounts of violence. So I hope that is a little more clear um, about how I'm connecting this to larger forms of sustainability, right? We need to be sustained in this moment of violence. Um, so I'm just gonna, and keep annoying hope by moving a little bit with my microphone <laughs> and drinking my bottled water. I'm just gonna read a little bit about this film, Marsha P. Johnson. Um, happy birthday, Marsha. So happy birthday, Marsha is centered on research that I've been doing, including interviews with people who knew Marsha best and were present in the village during the time of the riots. But it's informed with my experience going through archives, right, that so often um, tell us what we come to know as facts or what we have come in contact with inside an archive. Um, it's revealed that this happens through a violent discerning process, right? Um, of whose lives are valuable to record, whose actions are important to note. So the political project of Happy Birthday, Marsha, is to really flip that, right? We wanted to tell a story, Sasha and I, that wasn't constrained by what these archives tell us we can share about Marsha P. Johnson, who so often wasn't recorded in the New York Times, right? Who navigated so many forms of historical erasure. And as the author, Sadia Hartman, writes in Venus and Two Acts, we wanted to write a story that exceeds the fictions of history, that constitute the archive and determine what we can say about the past, right? Sadia says, I long to write a new story, one unfettered by the constraints of legal documents. Um, because a lot of times those legal documents, as Ms. Major points out, um, really exist as obstacles to being our full selves and telling the truth about our stories. So with that in mind, we set out to share a fuller scope of our social history that extends beyond when we were simply and only oppressed or when we were simply and only acted exceptionally, right? So often when we hear about Marsha or Sylvia or even Miss Major, we only hear about them doing some incredibly radical things, right? Doing these really beautiful moments. And so what I think are really powerful are these small personal ways that people illuminate their own contradictions, right? Um, and that we can ultimately learn from. Um, so we did this by locating the story in the intimate everyday actions made by Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson and not the actions and violences that happened to them, right? We wanted to show how they were sustaining each other in relationship with each other. The story moves away from the more fact-based work that I've done to record the lives of Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, and star street transvestite action revolutionaries. And because more important to us than who threw the first shot class at the NYPD, right? Um, who threw the first uh, Prada bag at the, at the officer, um, was 
or even who was present at that day at the time of the Stonewall riots was about giving space to the lives and relationships of people who had been treated as disposable when it comes to recounting history in general or even LGBT history or even especially feminist history, right? To fill the screen and to focus on our agency rather than simply the violences that happened to us. So that I wanted to offer as like my way of striking back, right? Um, to do that through art, to do that uh, in a way that sustained my relationship um, with my community and hopefully offer a form of nourishment for those of us who are like starving in the wake of historical erasure. Um, and I wanted to close with some words by my friend, um, my late friend, the trans activist and writer Bryn Kelly, who died last month. Um, so Bryn was a writer in New York City, um, and she was a brilliant uh, activist. And some years before she died, she did this really wonderful review of a book called Captive Genders. And in it, she offered some reflections about how we sustain ourselves, right? How we make a way out of no way. So I'll close with an excerpt of her words, which call back to Sylvia's own words around how she and her friends made meaning of the world together by praying, right? By thinking about when things were gonna change and by figuring out the world together. Um, the quote uh, mentions me and I'm like, so I was like, oh, should I share it or not? But um, I thought it was actually a really powerful quote. Um, so, uh, so Bryn says, so how do we deal, right? Which is another way of saying, how do we sustain ourselves, right? In this culture of everyday violence, what do we do? When this terrible shit keeps happening to us and our friends, how do we resist not only the injustice of, injustices of the state, but the creeping hopelessness that worms its way into the cracks of our soul and makes us never want to leave the house again? In the closing essay of the book, Raina participates in a roundtable discussion about visions for abolitionist movement. She talks about her work with the Welfare Warriors and Queers for Economic Justice, saying, if we're trying to build a grassroots organizing project that encompasses all of us, we need to make sure shame and isolation are challenged and incorporated into our organizing. Of course, we are not victims. We are fighting back. So that was the end of my quote. Um, Bryn then says, Rainer offers and the Welfare Warriors offer a list of results for the survey um, that the project did with its participants about how they attempt to cope with the shit that the system slings at them every day, right? How do we sustain ourselves in this moment? I would like to present the top results for you here, Bryn says, as a sort of a found poem. I'm going to print this out and stick it on my wall and repeat it to myself every goddamn day. And Bryn's poem is, we tell each other what happened. We write in journals. We have fun. We exercise. We meditate. We make art. And we pray. Thank you. So we have about 10, 15 minutes for some questions. And uh, wow, there's one right there. <laughs> so why don't you go ahead and get started? Hi. Hi. Thank you for saying that. I also am really always appreciative as a sick and disabled queer femme of color of how you always bring disability and ableism into the room. So thank, thank you. you so much for doing that. Thank you for saying that. I was wondering if you could speak at all. Um, in my understanding of Marcia P. Johnson and Sylvia yeah. Rivera's life, they were both transgender women of color yes. who lived with what's medicalized as mental illness yes. and also maybe with disability. Absolutely. And I'm wondering if you could speak to how disability and like the brilliance of disabled and mad bodies played out in their resistance and, right. and what, it's, what it means for sustainability questions that we're all sitting with. I mean, I think that that's such a, that, that's the question, right? And it's so wild to be sitting above you as someone that I feel like I'm learning with and through your work all the time. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll come down. But um, I think that Right, so one, I feel like one of the violences of um, ableism is that it erases all of the people who are navigating disabilities from, from, the, from the narrative, right? So Marsha had psychiatric disabilities, right? She was frequently um, in uh, different forms of psychiatric institutions, and she was organizing around that when she was, um, 
you know, when she was, uh, one of the most profound words that I found of Marsha is in an interview called Rapping with the Street Transvestite Revolutionary. And she talks about being inside institutions and um, building relationships with other people who are navigating those same kinds of conditions and that the movement needed to start and center those, needed to not just start centering those people, but needed to start there, right? Because if we're not centering people with disabilities, if we're not centering uh, people of color with disabilities, and if we're re releasing, or erasing that from, from our movements, then we're really failing each other, right? And um, we're making ourselves, opening ourselves up to so many forms of state violence. And so Marsha, I think, wasn't just someone who was a brilliant artist and activist, but she was, had this, incredible political imagination, right? Um, she had a freedom dream for like how to move through these conditions and how to do it without leaving people behind. Um, so I think that question to me is so vital. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah. Okay. So I guess I think um, there's like a lot of conversation and murmuring around that comment. I think that violence against um, gendered violence is one of the most pressing issues, right? I think if we start from the understanding that trans girls are girls, right, then we have an understanding that the violence against girls needs to include an understanding of transphobic violence, right? It needs to un include an understanding of how gendered violence can play out differently for cis girls than for trans girls. And one of those violences um, that all of us are navigating, I would say, is the gender binary. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much for the beautiful talk and images and sounds and feelings. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about, like, uh, the role of aesthetics yeah. in liberation and, tr and specifically like trans liberation movements and how do you see aesthetic work as political work mm -hmm. pushing beyond the limits of trans visibility right, right now? On a completely different topic, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm wondering about your thoughts and comments and just ideas around how to move beyond the U.S. border. Because yeah. I find that there's a really strong movement around undocu queers. Yes. Um, a lot of work being done in India around caste and the, the links with non gender conforming folks and gender queer movements. So just thinking beyond New York City, beyond right. continental US, but how can we build bridges of sustainability yes. in the global international context? I think that's so right. I am, so I would say it's already happening, right? Um, when I was on my way to do that conversation about black women navigating criminalization, it was in Canada, right? And a lot of people participating in it were people who were challenging and who have been building movements around transphobia um, as it plays out in immigration detention centers, right? I would look at not one more. I mean, there's just, it's, it's a really vibrant movement. So I think that question, people have like really good questions at 11 a.m., right? <laughs> like this is the room to be in. I think that is right, right? So pushing back against the understanding, pushing back, inherently when we push against back, when we push back against borders and when we're bolstering the social movements that are doing that work, I think we're pushing back against colonialism, right? Which I think is a really important thing to name as one of the primary predators of our community is settler colonialism. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. And then for Che, Che has been asking me questions my whole life because Che is my <laughs> sibling. Um, <laughs> I think that is a, that's a really important question. Um, I think one of the things that I started to realize when Miss Major was talking about, oh, I want to change my ID back to male, it made me think about striking back, right? And so I, the film we shot, and Shay is in it, um, after this conversation with Miss Major, and I started to think about, well, what are the things that, on a really personal level, that I just don't get down with? And I started to really understand that kind of an austerity of expression right, which is so pervasive in our social movements and austerity that um, says, like, the most stern is the most revolutionary, right, the least fabulous is the most radical. Um, I really internalized some of that 
And I started to understand that actually my way of striking back is to, um, is to really question that within myself, right? To, to understand like, Marsha was fabulous not just because she was a brilliant thinker, but part of her fabulousness was she lived in the flower district and made a new flower crown every day. And I think that is what I'm talking about, you know, when I'm talking about the aesthetics of trans liberation. Um, Fashion, I think, is so important. One of the ways that we've literally been policed, as I was trying to talk about in the, um, in the keynote, is through anti-cross-dressing laws, right? Like, we have had to face our community, and still, for those who are currently incarcerated, literally the fashion police, right? Like, we're actually being arrested by the fashion police. Um, and so, sometimes, those messages, right, that transgressing boundaries can move through us. That's why I brought up the five eyes of, um, of oppression, right? Those ideologies can become internalized. They can separate ourselves from each other. And one of the ways that I want to strike back against that is through aesthetics of trans liberation. So what that meant in the film is working with Gia Wyeth, who is a really beautiful and brilliant um, black trans musician who did the score of the film um, that Sasha and I worked with, Arthur Jaffa, who um, shot Daughters of the Dust and a lot of films for Spike Lee and Stanley Kubrick shot the whole film, we really tried to think about um, how to tell a story through, um, through different forms of beauty that the state always says aren't beautiful. Hi, Raina. Hi. Hi. I always enjoy listening to you. I learn something new each time. Um, Thank you. There's a, a few things you said. One about making meaning of our histories, and yes. another about asking questions over and over in order to go deeper. Yes. I wonder if you could share something on both of those or one of them yeah. about. So, how do we make meaning, and how have you found it to make meaning? So. I think and I think the other question about going yeah. deeper, asking over and over, sometimes I get frustrated and I feel like, why are we asking this over and over? But mm -hmm. you kind of gave me a new frame for it. So could you say a little more about that? So I am, the term speculation, uh, I became familiar with it in the text, The Undercommons, um, by Fred Moten and Stefana Harvey. And they were talking about speculation being a thing that you know, we do all the time, right? It has this big word, speculation, but we actually, we do. We sit in a room and we're like, well, when, when are things gonna change, right? And each, t each time we have like a different answer, like things are gonna change tomorrow. Things are gonna change when we pass that policy. Things are gonna change when like so-and-so gets elected. But we, we come to new different kinds of meanings each time we ask the same question. Um, for me, I think about capitalism being something that is deeply invested in us not doing the same thing over and over and over again. Like, I was thinking about it, um, just like my own attachment to the seasons, right? I love the, I love the summer, right? And for a while, I only wanted to like have summer all the time. It's like kind of scarily happening right now, right? Where <laughs> it's like the hottest, hottest um, you know, months on record in New York City. I started to realize, though, what is really powerful is going through an entire process to arrive on summer, right? Like, I learned something new, which each season, and this sounds kind of, you know, corny and whatever, but I felt like I was getting deeper by allowing myself to be in a process, right? I think about that with, like, um, the selling of cut flowers, right? It's about the end product of, um, of germination, right? It's the end product of growth. And I think capitalism really kind of loves that end product. It doesn't necessarily love us getting deeper, especially when we're asking questions about how to get rid of capitalism. So that, to me, is like <laughs> just the, a thought about that question about getting deeper each time. And then I forget what your first question was. Yeah, I mean, I think it was so wild, you know, so Bryn, um, a lot of us in this room, I think, have been affected by Bryn's passing, knew Bryn personally, but to me, I thought it was really powerful that Bryn really connected with some of the same words that Sylvia was talking about doing in the Arista Hotel in the era before Stonewall, like praying, right, just like looking for a way out, um, which were the same words that Many of us who were in queers for economic justice, many of us who uh, had navigated poverty before growing up or were currently in poverty, came together and we found like we're already doing this work. So to me, I thought that was really powerful to trace um, ways that 
pre-Stonewall, early in the 60s, people were do having some of the same strategies to try to figure out a question, and we're still doing them today, and I think they're working, right? Like, um, conditions are changing, and they're changing, kind of, this is going to, back to your second question, by doing some of the same things over and over and over again. I want to thank Raina again for thank your insight you, into... Yeah.